Well, welcome to our study of Second Peter, and, and let's start out with a word of prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, this is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we thank you for this day and for the blessings that you've given us of today, the blessings of life and health, uh, the blessings of, of, um, of your church, the community that, um, where we can gather together around your word, and above all, for the blessing of your word. We ask that you would be present with us now, that your word would be effective in our hearts and in our lives, that your word would strengthen and encourage us and, and build us up. Uh, so bless us in that word, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, we're in Second Peter chapter 2. Uh, last week, as we, um, uh, we got, got through the first nine verses of, of Second Peter chapter 2, and it, it was the beginning of a discussion on false teachers. And, and uh, we don't know exactly who Peter is writing to in his letters. He doesn't address them to a specific church or a specific congregation. Uh, but what we do know is that whoever he's writing to are dealing with false teachers in their midst. Right? And so you might remember just as the flow of the book goes along at the end of chapter one, he uh, he is reminding everyone about the importance of the word and staying faithful and true to that word. And then here at the beginning of chapter two, he, he, now, um, he now turns to false teachers and those who, who distort that word of truth and who don't teach according to that word of truth. And so uh, we'll be picking up in, in verse number 10 uh, today. Actually, I think we might have read the first part of verse 10 last week. Um, verse 10 is kind of a transition between uh, two minor sections. They're, they're all, all talking about false prophets. Um, so let's, uh, picking up in verse 10 here. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Uh, the this he's referring to, you might remember in, in verse uh, 8 and 9 last week, he talked about the destruction uh, that would come upon those uh, who are false teachers and those who are uh, rejecting the truth, right? So when he says this is especially true, he's writing of the destruction that would come on these false teachers. So this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings, Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, revealing in their pleasure, uh, excuse me, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They're experts in greed and a cursed brood. Woo. Yeah, I wish Peter would tell us what he thinks, huh? <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, yeah, he's not afraid uh, uh, to, to let him have it here. And as he does kind of let them have it, what are some, some further things we learn about these false teachers? We talked a little bit about that last time, some of the characteristics of false teachers. Uh, but here, as, as he really goes on a rant, I guess you would say, what are some further things we learn about false teachers? Well, I couldn't help but think as he was ranting on about all these terrible things, guys. I've some of those things. Okay. Seeing yourself among among some of the things he's talked about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He refers to them here as being bold and arrogant. Right? Um, so they're they're you know, they're not kind of sheepish, they're not just kind of afraid and hiding in the background. They are secretive. We talked about that last time, right? Um, but they're bold about their secrets. They're, they're, they're not ashamed of what they're doing. It's kind of like the world that um, everything's just out there. Um, you were reading this, I 
thought, oh, that apparently <laughs> was back then too, but I can remember being younger that things weren't so out there. Yeah. And now it's just like there are no rules basically, or there are, but um, they're easily overlooked. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, very, we see, we see reflections of our own day and age in these words, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and kind of the uh, idea that, um, uh, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, things don't change, you know, we're, we're still dealing with the same things today they did there. Um, and kind of very much an in your face kind of thing that's happening here. Yeah. Pastor, were these men around before um, Jesus started preaching or are they trying to um, get, um, I don't know what to say, uh, get some glory of their own in trying to copy what he's doing? Uh, I, you know, I think since we don't know the exact false teachers he's speaking of, we don't know the exact people he's writing to, therefore we don't know the exact false teachers. We, we don't know all of the details, but okay. I would say in, in general, both of those answers are true. Okay. Uh, in general, there were some that uh, that were around at the time and even before Jesus. Um, uh, and of course, at that point, they were false teachers, not kind of from a Christian perspective, but it would be more from the Jewish perspective, the Old Testament perspective. Uh, they were there and present. Um, but then we see, we definitely, I think, uh, historically, we see as, as the church spreads, you know, um, we see this, these false teachers start to crop up in, in these new churches. And so um, it, it's kind of a both and. Um, he describes them as they don't understand creatures of instinct. Um, all right, again, so again, so some very strong words he has uh, for these false teachers, for the way they behave and, um, and for the way they act. Um, and one of the accusations that Peter brings against them is here in verse number 10, he says that they heap abuse on celestial beings. They heap abuse on celestial beings. Um, celestial beings being a reference to angels, okay? Um, and so again, because we don't know exactly who these false teachers are, we don't know exactly what Peter is making reference to, all right? We, we don't know exactly what they're saying um, um, or exactly what they're, uh, what they're doing uh, in terms of the, the kind of this abuse on these celestial beings. Um, but one, uh, one theory um, or possibility is that Peter is making reference to um, to uh, what was a Jewish legend. It's, uh, we call it a legend because it was found nowhere in the pages of scripture um, uh, that this occurred. But according to Jewish tradition, maybe that's a better word to use for it, angels assisted God in delivering the Ten Commandments to Moses. Right? So remember Moses on Mount Sinai, God comes to Moses, gives him the Ten Commandments. According to Jewish legend, there were angels that were there also assisting God in the transmission of the Ten Commandments or bringing those Ten Commandments to Moses. Could have happened. We don't know. Angels are certainly involved in lots of different things. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it did take place, but we just don't have any recorded history of that based on scripture. It's really just tradition or kind of legend. Right? And so one theory is that, is that Peter is making reference to that um, and they're abusing celestial beings in that they are rejecting the law of God by their behavior. And if they're rejecting this law of God, they're also rejecting the messenger who helped deliver that law, namely the angels. Does that make sense? So, so it's... Uh, you know, you reject the message, you reject the messenger sort of thing. Um, and since they are rejecting the message of the law, perhaps Peter's making reference to their rejection of the messengers uh, being the angels themselves. Um, there is actually another um, reference in scripture that may be referring to the same thing. Again, we don't know if with 100% certainty, uh, but Galatians chapter 3 um, 
says, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. Okay, so Paul may be referring to the same Jewish tradition, right? The law was given through angels. Uh, he may be making reference back to that same thing um, in, in this verse, right? Um, well, may, maybe... Um... Maybe this is the wrong notion, but angels were more active and spiritual beings were more active before Christ than after Christ. I mean, it took an angel to announce the coming of Christ right. and the arrival of Christ. But once Christ got on the ground, he didn't need as much help or direction as um, from the angels as the average lay person did. Yeah, he, Hebrews does talk about, you know, that, that formerly God had communicated through prophets and angels, but now he communicates through his son. So there is definitely, uh, you know, I, I think scriptural basis for saying, you know what, the role of angels shifted after the coming of Jesus, mm -hmm. um, right? The uh, angels don't exactly behave or act in the same way anymore. Now, it doesn't mean angels are no longer active. Uh, Hebrews also talks about, um, that uh, encourages us, you should entertain strangers because you might entertain an angel and be unaware of it, right? So angels are still active, but I would say their role has changed, right? Because you're right, Susan, prior to, prior to Christ, angels were very much in the messenger role, right? Um, that, that was, uh, you know, they came, they announced the birth of Christ. They, um, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, we see angels coming as messengers to, to Abraham, for example, and to others. So um, they were there at the resurrection to announce the resurrection of Christ. So angels were very much in the messenger role prior to Jesus. And that role is shifted. We don't necessarily need the messenger role anymore because we now have the revealed word of God. We have the revealed Jesus in the New Testament. And so the role of angels is, is now more uh, kind of that servant role that, uh, that God uses them in. And, and they're still active. They're still there, just a, a, in a different way. Yeah. Um, so in that role of messenger, it would not be surprising at all for them to be involved in the giving of the Ten Commandments, kind of getting back to that. Okay. So even though we don't know exactly the... Uh, the exact things that these false teachers are doing. Uh, what we do know is, as he talks here, is that they are uh, bringing kind of disgrace upon the angels because of their behavior, because of their teaching. Uh, they are um, disgracing the angels, the messengers of God, the servants of God, uh, by what they're doing. Okay. So other comments or questions on that before we move on to the next part? The next thing I wanted to point out then is makes reference here to uh, in verse uh, 13 to the uh, it talks about uh, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. Okay, so uh, makes reference to these feasts uh, that are taking place. And again, Peter is not perfectly clear on what he refers to as as feast. However, what most commentators agree on is that he's probably making reference to the, the love feast of the New Testament, all right? And what that was is it, it, was a, it was a meal associated with the gathering of the church, the first version of the potluck, maybe, all right? It was a meal associated with the gathering of the church, and it had, it had a couple of functions. One function was it allowed those who um, were well off, those uh, maybe who were doing okay in life to provide for those who weren't, right? So by gathering together for this meal, those who could afford it would bring plenty of food and those who couldn't afford it would get a good meal out of it, right? So that was one role of these love feasts. It was an opportunity for the community to share with each other, essentially. Uh, the second role of the love feast is then uh, the love feast moved into a celebration of the Lord's Supper, all right? 
So it was first a celebration of the community, right? The relationships we share with each other. And then it turned into, it rolled, moved into a relationship or a, the, the relationship I have with my heavenly father or that we have with our heavenly father, right? So it's kind of both of those. Um, so probably a reference to that. How were they abusing these love feasts? What were they doing? They take advantage of the situation. And, um, you know, they act like they're oh so happy and to see you and everything. But um, they have evil desires in their heart. Yeah. At this time, it was a, a real occasion, I guess, for people to gather together. And eating was... Um, it was such an important part of welcoming people. Um, they didn't have the internet or the tell, they didn't all have a cell phone. And they, um, well, when they were all together, that was a good time for the, the bad, the, the evildoers to wreak havoc on the Christians. Absolutely. Gave them opportunity to take advantage of people. And this, you know, certainly talks about them taking advantage of people. Um, they were also, um, while taking advantage of people, it says eyes full of adultery, right? So, um, uh, so we've got evidently some kind of sexual pleasure that's going on with these false teachers or that these false teachers are promoting um, uh, or teaching about or encouraging in some way. Uh, it talks about the uh, reveling in their pleasures, right? So again, it wasn't for them, it wasn't about the, 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 the feast and what it really means, but they were abusing it, reveling in pleasures, and maybe just the pleasure of gluttony or the pleasure of, of drunkenness, or right? their, their focus was not on, on relationship, but their focus was on physical pleasure. Okay. Um, so what it, what it shows us is that these, these teachers took what was a gift of God, Right? I, I mean, the, the meal, the fellowship meal that they shared together was a gift. Um, like you said, Susan, they didn't, have, they didn't have the kind of communication we have today. And so that meal was a big deal for the community. Um, and it was important. And, and they took what was important, what was a gift of God, what was special in many ways, and they perverted it for their own pleasure, for their own... Um, goals and their own desires all right now we don't have love feasts the way they did um in that time all right we, we, we don't practice that same practice today but i think there are certainly examples we can also point to in which we take a gift of god that is intended for our good and for our benefit and we twist it and we turn it for our own pleasure we call that sin, right? But anytime we take what God intends for our benefit and for our good, we twist it to our own, our own benefit, our own pleasure. That's what these folks are doing here. Okay. It's kind of like some of the reality shows on TV. Oh, yeah. Um, with the getting together just to meet people and then Go beyond that. Yeah, yeah. Some of the reality shows on TV really depict that pleasure, don't they? And and that pursuit of pleasure. Um, I've never watched it, but I see advertisements for for that one Love Island. You know, I mean, it just looks awful. Um, yeah. And uh, but yeah, they're they're taking that what God intended for good for our benefit, uh, and they're pursuing it for their own pleasure. They're perverting it. For their own pleasure. And that's what our children are hearing. Sure. Yeah, that's the sad part. Yeah, yeah, you're right, Mary. Our kids are hearing that. Yeah. We're hearing that, right? Uh, we, we're bombarded by that all the time, right? And so th there is that sense of kind of the false teachers of, of our culture, even, that are teaching us to uh, misuse and abuse the gifts of God. 
Any other comments or questions on, on that part? We said in this section, Peter really does not mince words. He really lets them have it. Uh, and you kind of see that at the end, right? This, this whole section is just kind of building and building and building. Um, I, I picture if, if Peter were, were doing a, uh, were given a sermon, I mean, this is the fire and brimstone sermon. And by the end of it, he's pounding his fist on the pulpit and waving his Bible in the air and he's shouting at everyone, right? It builds and builds and builds. And at the end, he uses those words. He says to them, you are an accursed brood, an accursed brood. And uh, those words may sound familiar to you because they were certainly familiar to Peter. And this is one of the neat things I like about Peter. We really see the influence of Jesus in the life and ministry of Peter. And this is one of those. And so uh, we're going to look up a, a verse here. Um, let me pull it up. Uh, Matthew, I believe it is. Uh, oh, there it is. A cursed brood he makes reference to. Yeah, Matthew chapter 23. Uh, Jesus here, uh, verse 29, you see the context. He's addressing the teachers of the law and Pharisees. Um, and, and so, Cheryl, you asked about, you know, are, are these teachers that Peter's addressing, are these new folks? Uh, and I mentioned, no, they, they were around even at the time of Jesus. And here's an example of that, right? The Pharisees would have been a good example of that. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, and then he says in verse 33, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? All right. and, and standing alongside Jesus as he spoke these words is Peter, listening, observing, watching. And the, the, the words that Jesus speaks here now have, are influencing this letter that Peter is writing years and years later. Um, all right, let's get to the next uh, section, verses 15 and 16 we're going to take next. Um, again, they, making a reference still to these false teachers, they have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice, and restrained the prophet's madness. Okay, so he um, he equates what these teachers are doing to what Balaam was doing in the Old Testament. Balaam and the donkey, and you know you may remember the story of Balaam and the donkey. Balaam's um, riding his donkey one day, right, and the donkey just kind of stops. And Balaam starts beating on the donkey to get him to go and abusing this donkey. And the donkey just won't move and won't move and won't move. And, um, and finally, the donkey speaks to him. Um, and, you know, why are you abusing me? And turns out the donkey stopped because standing in front of the donkey was an angel with a flaming sword. And the donkey saw it, but Balaam didn't. And that, that angel was going to strike Balaam dead but the donkey was essentially saving his life, right? So that's kind of the, the, the Sunday school story of Balaam and the donkey. And that's the part of the story that most people remember. But do you remember why Balaam was going on a donkey ride in the first place? We don't have time to look it up today, but the story is in the book of Numbers. Uh, you can write it down 22 to 24 is kind of where the story of Balaam takes place, okay? But uh, what happens there is uh, God's people are coming into the promised land, all right? And as they come toward the promised land, they encounter some enemies along the way. And each and every time they defeat these enemies. And they are coming um, to the plains of Moab. And, um, and the leader of the Moabites sees him coming and says, you know what? I don't, I don't want to be defeated too. So I'm going to call Balaam because I hear Balaam, he's a prophet, right? And I'm going to call Balaam and I'm going to ask Balaam. I know, in fact, I'm going to pay Balaam to speak curses on the people of Israel. So he summons Balaam and says, Balaam, I'd like you to curse the people of Israel for me. I'll pay you very handsomely and I'll make it worth your while. 
And Balaam's response essentially is, I can't do it because God has not spoken curses against the people of Israel. And I cannot speak contrary to what God has said. I have no choice. I've got to speak what God said. And he has not spoken curses against Israel. I won't do it. This leader of Moab, though, is very persistent. Uh, he calls Balaam, uh, or yeah, Balaam, he calls uh, multiple times. And, and finally, Balaam is seduced by this wealth that he's offered. Right? He's offered this great sum of wealth and great money uh, to, to curse the people of Israel. Balaam still can't call down curses on the people of Israel, but what he tells the leader of Moab, he says, I know what you can do. If you want them to be cursed, I can't speak curses, but I know what will cause them to be cursed. You take your women, you seduce their men. That's contrary to what God has, wants them to do. If your women can seduce their men into relationship with them, God will bring down curses on the people of Israel. And so when Balaam's donkey, uh, you know, that, that's, that's what's going on when, when Balaam's donkey stops him. Um, he, he um, you know, wouldn't allow him to, to bring these curses to the people of Israel. And so that's ultimately what Moab does. Uh, Moab ultimately seduces, the women seduce the men of Israel, and God does bring down a curse um, on Israel because of their behavior and because of their action, right? So getting back then to Peter's reference, he's comparing what Balaam did to, to what these false prophets are doing or these false teachers. He's saying these guys are acting in the same way. They're in it for the money. They're in it for their own greed, their own benefit, and they are willing to allow God's people to essentially be cursed because of their actions and their behavior. They are seducing God's people. They're dragging God's people away for their own benefit and, and um, so that they can be gifted in that way. So that's what he's kind of telling us by using the example of Balaam and his donkey. So any questions on that or, or, or thoughts that you have on, on him including that? So I take this literally because it's in the Bible. The donkey spoke. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I had a donkey and it started speaking to me, that would, <laughs> that would get my attention. Wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we believe it spoke. Yeah. And, and yet, it didn't get Balaam's attention enough to... How can you not pay attention to that? Yeah. The seduction of the world is strong. Yeah. All right, the last section then of chapter two. We'll see how much of this we can get through with the time we have left. Verse 17, uh, these people, again, he's still referring to these false teachers. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they're worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Uh, so again, he continues to have not much nice to say about these false prophets. 
strong, strong words of warning. Uh, and this section starts out with a metaphor. Did you notice that? He says that they're like springs without water. What do you think he's trying to teach us by that? Springs without water. What does that mean? You think you're going to get something good that, well, they're disappointed. There's nothing there. They're just, they don't, they don't even exist. Yeah. 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 You think you're getting something good and there's nothing there. Right. Um, uh, similar to what we'd call a mirage in the desert, right? You look at it and you're like, oh, I'm finally going to get some water and it just disappears and it's gone. It promises one thing, but it can't deliver on the promise. It gives you something else. So he's saying these false teachers are, are doing that. They're promising one thing, but they're not able to deliver. He talks about their empty words, their empty words. It sounds good. It sounds like, oh, this is good stuff, but it's not going to give you ultimately what you need. You know, we talked earlier about how there's nothing new under the sun. Satan has been doing that since the beginning of time, right? Remember the, um, the temptation of, of Adam and Eve? If you eat of this tree, you will be like God. He promised them something he couldn't deliver. He says, here's what your life's going to be like. Here's, it's going to be easy. Life's going to be like God. Well, you have everything you want. No problem. And he tries it. They, they try it. Right? And nothing. And, uh, and Satan acted like that in, in Peter through these false teachers, promised them something that he couldn't deliver. And how, you know, you think about it, that's so much the, the way sin still is today, right? It's Satan promising something he can't deliver. Oh, here, try this. Oh, here, try that. Oh, you'll like this. Oh, this will make you feel better. You know, just, just a little drink. It'll take the edge off. Um, just a, a little of this. It'll, it'll make you feel better. And, and he can't deliver. Maybe it makes you feel better for a while, right? Or it feels good at the time. But we know sin, ultimately, it leaves you feeling worse. And uh, ultimately leads to destruction. Um, and that's what these false, false teachers are doing. And, and did you notice here in, in Peter, who's their target? Who are they targeting according uh, to Peter here? Unsteady souls. Unsteady souls. Um, is that what, is that what your how your translation yeah. reads there? Great, I like that, that's kind of cool. 14. I like that. In they entice unsteady souls. Ooh. Yeah, I like, I like that. Um, here in 18, he describes them as this, people who are just escaping. Uh, so in other words, he's referring to new Christians. That these, that these false teachers target new Christians because they are the unsteady soul. Right? They don't, they, they're maybe excited about their faith. They're excited to be part of this new community, but they don't know a lot yet. They're still learning. Um, they're, they're still trying to figure things out. They're still trying to find their way, right? They're, they're just escaping from the errors that they used to be in. And so it makes them vulnerable to the, the work of the false teachers. And I think this is a good encouragement for us as a church to make sure that we are looking out for the new Christians whether it's a new member to the church or a new, a new Christian who's just been baptized or who's just come to the faith, right? We need to be concerned about them. We need to be caring for them. We need to be watching out for them uh, because it is so easy for them to become targets. Um, targets, uh, not just of false teachers, but ultimately targets of Satan himself, right? Those are the ones he feels like he can drag astray. We, we talked about that back at the end of 1 Peter when he, he talked about the devil is like a roaring lion looking for someone who, to devour, right? Who do, the, who do the lions target? The weak ones and the vulnerable ones. Satan targets the new Christians. We got to protect them. We got to keep them safe. We got to teach them these things. Our kids would be examples of that, right? They're, they're newer Christians. They're, they're not as strong as their faith. They're, they don't have all the answers yet. 
they become easy targets, especially easy targets when they get to high school and college age. And, you know, that's so often when we start losing them, we got to do better at, at keeping them. We got to do better at, at um, looking out for them and keeping them safe. Next comes some very strong words of warning. Verse 21, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turned their backs. Here he's referring to those, again, um, well, I guess he could be referring to those new Christians, but I think he's also referring to the false teachers, maybe who, who had the truth at one point or who knew the truth at one point. And he says, you know what? It would have been better for you if you would have just never come to the truth at all. Um, and so it's a strong word of warning. It reminds us uh, a couple things. Number one, that it is possible to fall from the faith, right? Um, there are some theologies that will tell you once you're saved, you can never fall from the faith. That's not what this says, right? They knew the way of righteousness. They were saved, but then they turned their back on it. And he is warning them of the destruction that's coming because of that. Right? It's this, this is something that's very, very serious. So it is possible to fall from the faith. And, and the consequences of falling from the faith are, are, are you know, horrible. Right? I mean, we're talking eternal judgment here. Um, and it's, it's maybe it's, it's more horrible for the person who fell from the faith because it's like they had it and they lost it. You know, it was right there in their grasp. It was theirs. The person who never had the faith, they, didn't, they don't know what they're missing, right? But the person who was in the faith and then loses it, now uh, when they're experiencing that judgment and that punishment, they're going to know what they're missing. And I think that's part of why it's worse for them um, be, because of that, okay? And then, and then finally, I'll point out one more thing and then uh, any questions that you might have. Verse 22 um, he quotes the Proverbs. He says, uh, refers to them as a dog who returns to its vomit. Well, what is the heck, what the heck does Peter mean about that? If we look at the proverb itself, I think it helps us out. And we talked last week in, in some of the stuff, you know, that scripture interprets scripture. When we want to understand one part of God's word, we turn to another part of God's word. And, and that's the case here as well. And so Proverbs 26, 11 is where that comes from. As a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. Right? So why does he quote it? He's saying, hey, you guys are being foolish. You are going back to that which wasn't good for you in the first place. You're just making the same old mistakes over and over and over again, just like a dog returns to its vomit. Um, come on, be smart about this, he's saying. You made that mistake once, you don't need to make that mistake again. Um, let's learn from it, let's, uh, let's move on from it, okay? Questions or comments about that section? I know we kind of rushed through that section there. There's really a lot there. Uh, we probably could have taken a whole week just on those few verses that we just looked at, but any comments or questions on that last section we looked through? Well, what I was thinking that it almost sounds like sin is like an addiction. Mm -hmm. um, you're weak and you're enticed by it and the, the promise that, well, if, if you do this drug, you'll feel better. Yeah. And... Um, then before you know it, you become a slave to that drug. Mm -hmm. And um, even when you know that's wrong, you just go back and you do it again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like Paul says in Romans 7, right? The good that I want to do, I don't do. And the good that I know I shouldn't, or the bad that I know I shouldn't do, I keep on doing it. It is. It's an addiction. And, and all sin, whether, whether it's an addiction in the, in the normal sense of that term, like alcoholism or drug addiction, um, even, if, even if it's not one of those addictions, sin ultimately is an addiction. It's an addiction to doing wrong. It's an addiction to myself and my own glory. Um, there's a Christian recovery program called Celebrate Recovery. 
there are actually a few churches in our town that have Celebrate Recovery groups. And it's Celebrate Recovery is based on the same principles as AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, for example. But one of the tenets of Celebration Recovery is that we are all addicts because we all sin. And that sin is just that. Sin is an addiction. You keep going back to it even though it's not good for you. Yeah. And that's what Peter warns us of here. Any other thoughts or questions? Pastor, I just wondered what um, translation of the Bible you're doing, because I have the NIV, but yours is very similar. The, I have the study Bible, but every, every couple of words are different. Yeah, so this, um, I, I'm using the NIV as well. However, NIV about, oh gosh, I can't remember, 10 years ago maybe now, um, did a revision or an update to, the, to, their, to their translation. Um, so you have there, I think, I think your ver yours is probably the, I think it was a 1984 version of the NIV. Okay. Um, and then, and then they recently updated it. So if you go, you, uh, if, if you search online and that's why I use the newer version, because I, I pull my, uh, my Bible quotes and stuff offline, it's, it's hard to find that older version of the NIV online anymore. You have to use okay. the new version. So, yeah. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the new version. I actually prefer the one you've got there, Cheryl. Okay. It's like even we had St. James version mm -hmm. when we were growing up. And there's still some things in there that I like better than what yeah. we have interpreted. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you get used to hearing and reading God's word in a certain way. Mm -hmm. It was so hard for me when our church, um, our, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod as a whole, kind of moved away from the NIV and moved to the English Standard Version. So uh, they did that when they came out with a new hymnal. Um, was that 15 years ago or something like that? Yeah. They moved uh, to the English Standard Version. Uh, it's probably a better translation in a lot of ways. So I, I like it from that respect. But the public reading of the word, I don't remember what it was this last Sunday that I was reading. Um, which of the readings was it that caught me? Um, oh, I think it was, I think it was the, the Old Testament reading uh, this Sunday uh, from Genesis. Um, the way the ESV reads is just a little different than what I'm used to in the NIV. And it kind of tripped me up in one of the services this Sunday because I, I, I know that old NIV so well and I've done it so many times. It's just habit. And, and so, yeah. Hmm. I remember telling our pastor during um, Advent that I don't like to think of baby Jesus being wrapped in strips of cloth. Uh -huh. I need my baby <laughs> Jesus wrapped in swaddling cloth. We need him swaddled, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These are not just some dirty rags. I'm with you. I'm with you. So, Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your truth and your word that guides us and guards us and protects us. And we pray that we would continue to grow in that word so that we would be protected from the teachings of the false prophets. Um, Lord, but we also need to be protected from ourselves because each of us is prone to sin and that old Adam within us so easily wants to return to the brokenness um, and we pray that you would protect us from that, that you would keep us from that, forgive us when we turn to that, um, and just fill us with grace and strength um, so that we can be protected from that. Uh, we pray for your church and for your people. Uh, we just ask for a continued um, return to normalcy and, and a growing of your church and, and involvement of many people as they stay connected to you. Uh, we pray for our families uh, of our church. You know the needs that we have, and uh, we pray that you would be with us and bless us. And I pray for each of us who have been part of this study today and, and, and those who will watch later online. Uh, Lord, you know our needs, and we just pray that you'd be present with our home, in our homes. Uh, we pray that you would go with us into the community, uh, keep us safe in all that we do. But above all, continue to strengthen our faith um, that we may have hope and confidence in you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.